<laughs> they come here. Don't get all crazy on me. Stay calm. Don't go all crazy on me, ladies and gentlemen. And that is our watchword for the day. There are things that we can do. We don't have to elect anybody. We don't have to change anything. We've got the people and personnel and the Constitution in place right now. We can get a balanced budget without having to do a single thing. We don't have to pass an amendment to the Constitution. Our elected representatives in the House right now have the constitutional authority to balance the budget by the end of this year. And there isn't a thing that Barack Obama can do to stop him from doing it. Uh, we can stop the this lurch toward activist judges. We can prevent Barack Obama from appointing another activist judge to the Supreme Court. We don't have to pass another law. We don't have to elect another single individual. There are enough senators right now to filibuster every nominee that Barack Obama would bring to the bench. So we talk to our representatives between now and the end of the year because the debt ceiling is going to hit. They may have to try to deal with it in lame duck. They may push it off to January, but it's going to have to be dealt with pretty soon. And here's what we say to a Republican. This is what we say to a Republican in the House of Representatives when he asks us, do, does he want us to raise the debt ceiling. There are just so very many ways for me to say this to you. Never, not in a million years, absolutely not. No way, Jose, no chance, Lance, and yet, negatory, mm -mm, nah, uh uh, and of course, my own personal favorite of all time, man falling off of a cliff. No! So that's what we are prepared to say to members of the House of Representatives, see if we can be clear with them about what, what we want them to do. With regard to the debt ceiling, 888-589-8840 is the number to call, 888-589-8840. And speaking of Hurricane Sandy and the devastation it brought, let's listen to Chris Matthews. And, you know, the liberals are always the one that are lecturing us about compassion, how much they care about the little guy. They care about people. Hurricane Sandy killed 106 people. It's wiped out Staten Island. Uh, Staten Island. It's wiped out boroughs in New York. People still going without food, going without water, having to go to ba the bathroom in the hallway of the places where they live because there's no, uh, there there are no working restrooms in their building or in their neighborhood. And Chris Matthews is all delighted. He is happy, ladies and gentlemen. Chris Matthews is happy about Hurricane Sandy, and he explains why. Uh, I am so proud of the country to re-elect this president and overcoming, not because of the partisanship or any of the, even the policies, just the fact, here's an African guy, African-American guy from an unusual background, uh, part immigrant background, part African-American background, with all this assault on him from day one, from Mitch McConnell, from the clowns out there that aren't elected, never will be to anything, and the way he took it, as somebody said it, with coolness and charm and, and dignity, and just took it and took it and kept moving forward and doing his job. And, and, and the American people, and I know we look at these percentage, 40% of the white vote, fine. That's about right among Democrats in the last couple cycles, three cycles or four. Good work for them, good work for him, a good day for America. I'm so glad we had that storm last week. Because I think oh. the storm was one of those things. No, politically, I should say, yeah. not in terms of hurting people. The storm brought in possibilities for good politics. So Chris says, yeah, uh, loss of life there. That's regrettable. Sorry about that. But on the whole, I'm glad that it happened because it gave Barack Obama a victory at the polls. Let's go to Chris in Meridian, Mississippi. Chris, you're on Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Uh, good afternoon, Brian. Uh, Howdy. Just a... Uh, uh, statement i was listening to uh, buster earlier and then the continued coverage talking about the uh, uh the, the four states that uh, have legalized i guess gay marriage or yes. are allowing it in some way shape form or fashion uh, you know the, the statement keeps coming up the full faith and credit clause but something that i think is not is not seen sometimes in this uh that full faith and credit clause does not it's not evenly applied across the board. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example that, that I was mentioning. Uh, I have a concealed carry weapons permit in the state of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah, there are regions of this country where this license that I am issued by my state is not given full faith and credit. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I mean, I would think that there is still some standing 
for the states that have enacted constitutional prohibitions against recognizing gay marriage to still have some standing in this. Would mm. you agree? That's very good, Chris, and that's a very, very good analogy. You know, I've looked at the laws with concealed carry, and there are any number of states with whom Mississippi, my home state, has a reciprocal concealed carry weapons permit uh, agreement, but there are a lot of states that don't. And so right. you I may would... have a concealed carry permit in one state, but if that reciprocal agreement doesn't exist, you can't carry concealed in that, that other state without getting uh, into trouble, without running enormous risk, because the full faith and credit clause does not apply. In fact, Chris, I don't have it in front of me. I could dig it up in the files, but I came across a Supreme Court decision from, a, from some time ago where the Supreme Court was dealing with an issue like this where you had a matter of public policy, which is what marriage and the definition of marriage really is. It's a matter of, of public social policy. And the Supreme Court said that, look, no one state has the power to dictate public policy to another state. Can't do it. Each state has the right to establish its own public policy. Each state has certain sovereign powers, and another state is not able to dictate to another state what its public policy will be, full faith and credit or not. Can't do it. So I believe they'd have a strong argument to make, look, full faith and credit does not compel one state to recognize homosexual relationships if that's contrary to the public policy in their state. Well, listen, Chris, I appreciate that. That's a great analogy. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Let's go to Paul in Wilmington, North Carolina. Paul, you're on Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Talk to me. What's on your mind? Yeah, Brian. um, I don't have as much uh, confidence in our representatives as you. I I really don't think that, at least in the House of Representatives, they at least have some cartilage. In in the Senate, uh, you know, they have jello for a spine. Um, this president has ignored the Constitution again and again and trampled it. And, and you know, he even mentioned in a speech um, that, you know, people, a lot of people would like him to bypass Congress altogether. And, and I, you know, what's to stop him? Well, you know, and I agree with you, Paul. Um, and I, I agree with you that the things I'm talking about can't be done unless you get some spinal fluid injection into members of the House and the Senate. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm not saying that it will happen. I'm not even saying that I'm sure it can happen. What I am saying that it's a possibility, and it could happen if there was enough spinal uh, uh, fluid in their cervical columns, yeah. they could do this thing. And what I'm saying is we don't have to break any laws to do this. We don't have to break any rules. We are using the Constitution and the provisions that are in the Constitution. And in the case of the filibuster, the filibuster is not in the Constitution, but it's in the Senate rules, and the Democrats are perfectly free to use that rule against us. So somebody uses the filibuster. They're not breaking the rules. They're just using the, the rules to their advantage, and there's absolutely no reason not to do that. So what I'm saying, Paul, is... I I think it's time to stop allowing the Republicans to pass all of the blame off on Barack Obama because there are things that they can do. Now, it's convenient for them uh, because of what you're talking about, the lack of of any kind of intestinal fortitude. It's convenient for them to lay everything off on Barack Obama. That way they can blame him for everything and they don't have to make the tough, tough choices themselves. And I think part of our responsibility is to remind them of their constitutional authority and their constitutional range of action. All right, Paul, listen, I thank you for the call, and, and I, I just want to be honest with Paul. I don't have any any more confidence in our elected officials than Paul does. I don't. But they, they can do something about this, and it's going to be up to us to make enough noise so that they know that they can do it and so that they know that we know. Uh, that they can do it so that they know that we know that if they don't do something, they are shirking their responsibility and that we're on to them, that we are on to them. We are not going to let them blame the the debt any longer on Barack Obama alone. We're not going to let them do it. We're going to say, look, you your fingerprints are all over this $2.4 trillion debt ceiling increase. The last one, your fingerprints are on that. You voted for that. You approved that. You endorsed that. You said, yes, let's raise the debt ceiling by $2.4 trillion. You did that. Barack Obama didn't do that. You did that. Let's go to Michael, Dallas, Texas. Michael, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? 
Well, hello, Brian. Uh, thank you for allowing me to climb aboard today. You bet. Uh, if you don't mind, I've got five quick things that I'll say, and then I'll get out of your way and let you make any comments you might want to make. Okay, got about a All minute. Right. We got about a minute, Michael, so hit them. One, Alan West. Rick Perry's great, but I'd love to see Alan West run. You know, and, and Alan West, it looks like he might lose, by the way. He's in a recount down there in Florida, but he could lose that election. You know, that's that election. Two, um, it, you know, they say that so many people didn't vote. Now, I'm not sure that they didn't. Uh, three is that uh, you look at New York and the things they're going through, two to three years, the whole country's going to be in that fix. Mm -hmm. And uh, four, if they uh, start uh, jacking with weapons, if Texas wants to secede, baby, I'm all for it. Other than that, you know, I really don't have much else, I guess, and I appreciate your time. Okay, well, Michael, listen, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, uh, Michael uh, uh, alluding, I assume, to the fact he thinks there might be something insidious going on with voter turnout, maybe votes not being counted. You know, I have not seen any evidence that that happened yesterday, and I'm not sure, frankly, that it could happen in enough volume to actually change the outcome of the election on Tuesday. But we'll keep an eye out for stories on voter fraud. We had a number of those on Tuesday that we covered on Election Day yesterday where there clearly was some voter suppression stuff going on, registration cards being shredded, uh, some places people being allowed to vote twice, being given an extra ballot. So we know that at least in some measure that kind of stuff was, was going on. You know, and uh, Michael's right about looking at New York. You look at Sandy, uh, you look at what Sandy did. You look at the Breezy Point. You look at Staten Island. That's where we're all going to be. Uh, in three to four years, unless we have Republicans in the House and Senate that will do their constitutional duty. And, uh, you know, it's the first time I anticipated we'd have it, but I think a lot of people in Texas in particular, uh, they're going to be talking about secession. And we'll talk about that in the next hour, about we really are a divided country right now. Herman Cain says it. We really are a divided country into two states, back in five. American Family Radio, AFR Talk.